Welcome to Hermit Woods, where there's a story in every bottle. Proprietor taught me uh, how to brew beer. I mean, he did, I can't say he taught me how to brew beer. He, he told me what things to put together in a particular order at a particular temperature, and my outcome may be uh, a beer. <laughs> so I think I was about 17 or 18 at the time. And uh, I'd go in there and I would hang out with him and I'd, uh, I would just, I was into clones. I would do a whole bunch of beers. The first beer I ever brewed was a uh, Sammy Smith Oatmeal Stout clone. That was really, really fun. Um, my brother really dug that. He, he, that was one of his favorite beers. So that was one of the first things I did. And then as far as mead goes, it was uh, 11th grade English lit class. I read Beowulf. And, uh, you know, as a, as a young angst teenager, I never realized I got anything out of high school. And here I am taking that experience for, or there I was taking that experience for granted. And uh, lo and behold, you know, mead was, was a hobby from 11th grade on, but it was, um, it was such a fun hobby. And I honestly, I would joke that I would make beer just to wait for my mead to finish. Um, and that's kind of how it, how it went on uh, for about 10 years. And then in 2000, 2007 or eight, uh, at that time, I had already made three or four years worth of our uh, sugar maple mead, um, and I wanted to find investment, and I wanted to start something. So I, I uh, started hitting up some of the people I knew in Wolfboro. I was a, a chef at the time over and started a, a restaurant over there with, with some folks. I, I wasn't an owner by any means. I was just uh, an employee, but uh, started a restaurant. What restaurant? Uh, that was Garwood's. Um, oh, okay. I remember Garwood's. Pub. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, we, I started there June 18th, 2001, and they opened June 21st, 2001. And, uh, and yeah, and that's where I met Rob, who's now my business partner at uh, Hobbs Tavern. And so him and I have worked together for almost 20 years in the, in the industry. Uh, but, you know, utilizing that network over in Wolfboro, uh, I knew, a, I met a couple people that, I had some money and some knowledge and some business uh, behind them. Uh, I approached, and they they certainly like to keep taking my bottles. I got one more person to talk to. I got one more person to talk to. Uh, and once I was out, they were like, "Oh yeah, I'm not interested." <laughs> so, um, you know that there was a couple of years later, uh, we were sitting down at Christmas dinner. Of course, Matt and I are uh, cousins, and uh, who's my pretty partner here at Sap House. We we're sitting down at my folks house Christmas dinner 2009 and we were talking about this building the one I'm sitting in right now. It was the town's first grocery store and from 1960 on it was really a storage locker for an elderly couple here in town and they had recently passed away and we talked about this because nobody wanted it. The town didn't want it. People weren't buying it and we were in the bottom of the bottom the lows of the lows of the recession of 2009 8 and 9 and we were able to to talk it through that night and that dinner that usually ends at like 7 30 and we go home ended up going until like two o'clock in the morning with my with my parents and we were like what do we need to do and we were googling and you know we learned about the ttv and the licensing and the process and by june 21st we bought the building uh we renovated through uh august 26th is when we got our license so we made our first batch of mead which we never released we actually still have it uh, what year was this that was uh, 2010. Okay. We made, our, we made our first batch August 26, 2010. And uh, I've never released that mead. We have 42 bottles. It's a blackberry maple. Um, I've never released it. Yep. It's been aging in bottles for nine years. <laughs> Something like wow, that. Wow. What does one have to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, you know, Bob, you know how it goes. Like how much has Ken or you or Chuck learned about winemaking or mead making in just the last couple of years, let alone the That's last right. 10, right? Absolutely. So I'm scared to even crack it open and be like, <laughs> oh my God, what was I thinking? You know, I, I know it'll be good, but <laughs> I don't know. A part of me is like, er, I don't know if I want to share that. That's a lot of pressure, but well, I think 10 year anniversary next year, 
uh, that'll, that'll come up. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do. We've tossed a lot of ideas around with that mead um, and we'll see, but I know it's on the drier side. You know, when we, when we first started making mead here at Sap House, we were very much like, we're going to, we're going to be the charge that shows everybody we, mead doesn't have to be sweet, you know, and that was our, our big stance. So all the meads we put out early days were just that they were dry. And um, it turned a lot of people on to what we were doing. I think a lot of the deep rooted fans that, that we have even today are, they remember those days and we've ebbed and flowed. We have strategy to what means we put out last year was the high of this wanted to do. We didn't, we don't want to go much sweeter than what we did last year. And 2020, uh, even though we're being swarmed by murder hornets and, and the COVID pandemic, Lord only knows what else is coming our way, but this year was geared to be our dry year, you know, and start, start going down the wavelength to producing some more of the drier, lower residual sugar uh, meads. So that was kind of a long winded answer for a, a, a short question. <laughs> well, no, it's actually great. You actually answered the next three questions on my list. Perfect. So you're, you're <laughs> <laughs> there we Nicely go. Nicely done. Nicely well done. done. That's I'm excited. I can't wait to uh, I can't wait to, to to see what happens with that first batch. That's exciting on a number of fronts for me. I mean, it's it's just you know it's your first batch. It's that special, regardless of what it tastes like. It's special. So and I'm I'm going to bet it's pretty damn good because I know what you can do. So uh, well, I, I'm going to try and get on the list for that. But um, so so I know I know where you are. So you you bought this this place that, as you described, self described, nobody wanted, and, and it was during a difficult time, of course. But but you could have opened your business anywhere, and you chose to open Sap House Meadery in this little tiny town. I think it's population what twenty five? Uh, no, it's more than that. But it's a tiny forty three hundred. We're like a <laughs> little metropolis now. <laughs> no, well, actually, forty three hundred is the, is all of Ossipi. That's yeah. great. Well. But the downtown area of Ossipi is a very small downtown, and um, yeah. and you made the choice to to put your business there instead of uh, you obviously could have chosen to, to have it in any number of locations where there are more populous, more people around, more foot traffic, any number of things. But you decided to put it there, and I've always been fascinated by that. And and I think I know. I mean, I've talked to you and Matt enough to know uh, much of the reason why. But but tell tell the audience what what drew you there and what makes you so passionate about that spot that you're in. Yeah, sure. That's I mean, it's a great question, and I love to answer it because it really illustrates the bigger picture that we're talking about here, right? Uh, we did start a business, and of course, with any business that you start, you want to be on Main Street, you want to be high traffic, uh, you know, you want everything going for you, zero adversity, perfect climate. Uh, everything like that, and and you know we were we were two awkward, simply faced kids. I mean, Matt was 22, I was 29 uh, when we started, and you know it boiled down to to what we could afford. I mean, that ultimately is is one thing you always have to take take into account. But the other thing was, you know, we were born and raised here, and this downtown area and knowing its history um, was hustling and bustling way back in the day, and. From the 1940s, 50s, and 60s on, it was really in this stagnation period, and, and it, it really wasn't growing. Uh, this town, the downtown area, like all rural New England towns, had been bypassed not only once. We were lucky enough to be bypassed twice. The train stopped, the train stopped coming, uh, and a big inn that was a really great restaurant um, burnt down in the 80s. I mean, it was just kind of like a super stagnation. And we saw an opportunity in it. You know, we uh, we could easily be on Route 16. I mean, to, even today, we've talked about it. We could easily put ourselves there. Um, I don't want to say easily, but it's not a hard decision to make for for whichever reason. But our our reasoning for for being here um, was intentional, and it was to be the spark as entrepreneurs to revitalize a downtown community. And we're doing that. We're seeing great success in that. And I think, you know, as um, as it's gone, I think the byproduct knowledge that we've received from this is if you're starting a winery or a meadery, you don't have to be on Boardwalk or Park Place in a metropolis because you're a manufacturer. And if you manufacture a great product and you have wonderful marketing and it's well thought out and you're strategic, people will find you. I mean. 
how many people intentionally get lost to find sandwich creamery? I know where it is if I hop in a car, but I couldn't tell you how to get there. You know what I mean? And like now you have an atlas. Is, if the kids watching don't know what an atlas is, it's a map. We now have those in our hands. And I mean, you can get wherever you need to now. I mean, you don't need it. You don't need to turn the page, you know, to find find the place. So I think all in all, it's benefited us. You know, we, we hear all the time we don't have parking and we, you know, roll our eyes and it's like, oh, you know, what are you going to do? I, I've never parked in front of the door at Hannaford and you're lucky if you have, but, you know, this is, this is what we have to work with and this is what we're doing. And ultimately what it's become is uh, the bigger picture here in our vehicle is Sap House Meter. The vehicle is Sap House Meter. The product, the experience, everything we do here is the vehicle. The big thing we want to do is leave the world better than when we found it or came into it. And we're working on that. We, Matt and I created and started the OSPE Economic Development Council, which, you know, it's, it's fledgling, but we're doing things. We're moving the needle and it's happening. I mean, this year we, or last year, 2019, we got brand new sidewalks. In. We've got funding and everything in place to put wonderful uh, like vintage antique lighting. And that's going to add so much character to a, a, a needed um, environment and atmosphere. We put in a $65,000, $60,000 playground last year for the community to be attracted to come into the center of town. Um, you know, we've, we've done it with some chagrin from others, but, you know, some people say that has nothing to do with economic development, but when you're in a metropolis of 10,000 people, I call it a metropolis, but when you have that many people, your needs aren't necessarily getting people there. They're already there. You just need to keep them there. We need attraction. We need people to come here before they even realize it. And that's, I think anybody in that kind of environment needs to understand that. And that's what we've learned. As I said earlier, there's byproduct knowledge that has come from that. And that's something we theorized and now we've kind of made tangible and, and slowly understood it more and more. That's great. I, I've, I've watched the, the, some of the things you guys have done, both you and Matt, uh, relative to the, to the politics of your town and getting involved. And, and it's great to see because uh, you, you're already driving it just by having a successful business on Main Street and, and then to, to be working in the background to, to help bolster the other parts of the, of the town that you can. is just really outstanding and I, I love it. I, it uh, it's great. Thank you for that. And, um, and so let's talk a little bit about your meet. So I'm going to ask you two questions. I'll ask them both at once. Uh, first, tell me a little bit about your best sellers, the ones that most of the people walk in the door and go, I got to have that, that mead. And then tell me what, what's something that maybe is particularly special to you other than your first batch. So those are two wildly different answers. Uh, what, what people come in for is not what they expect to leave with. So oftentimes they come in and they think, I'll mead sweet, I don't know. And of course we all joke in the, as a meadery owner, we all joke that people are coming in for some sort of beef or chicken tasting. Um, but, but ultimately they say, you know, I, I don't want anything sweet. I don't, I don't like sweet. And uh, they end up leaving with a more sweeter mead. Um, I don't know where that ever, that stigma ever came from where you can't like sweet things, but I digress. Uh, typically, I don't, I can't put a finger on a number one seller. We put out, you know, at any given time, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 different meads. Uh, right now, I mean, even behind me, I think I'm sitting in front of 14 or 15. Um, our barrel program has probably become our most popular amongst knowledgeable meat enthusiasts online. Mm. People coming through the door that are kind of unsuspecting uh, love the fruit and fruit bomb. The beer drinker and the person who doesn't like wine or beer seem to tend to lean towards the sparkling uh, carbonated canned meats that we put out. Um, so I don't know if I can really narrow it down to a single answer for your question, but I think that's a general kind of a, a mid-broad stroke. Uh, no, it's, ex that. 
that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And that's, and, and that, that sums it up nicely. And, and I got to add too that I'm, I'm excited about your barrel program too. I love what you guys have done with that. So. Well, thank you. And I mean, I, I really should have started this whole thing out, you know, ever since we've started and you said early on, you guys started around the time we did and pardon me for not remembering when you opened, but we've always had a, a, a kindred uh, spirit and, and friendship amongst Hermit Woods and Sap House. And, We've always admired the passion coming from Meredith and you guys, what you guys are doing at Hermit Woods. And I, I feel like we're, we're in the same wheelhouse when it comes to the thought, creativity, and the execution of recipes. And so thank you for, for being an awesome neighbor to the Northwest. And likewise. I have to like think about that. <laughs> um, as far as what I like and what, what's been going on on, on my end, um, you know, I've, I've had to, over the last year and a half, had to deal with some health struggles that I haven't gotten into big time with, with people, but uh, I've had to watch what I, what I eat and what I drink. And uh, it, it's not, you know, I'm not a diabetic or anything, but it's just something I, I, my doctor wants me to be watching. And, um, you know, I'm a lucky recipient of Lyme disease. So we're going through some testing and trying to figure out certain things. And when I do imbibe lately, what I find myself enjoying is, um, kind of going back to my roots, those means of subtlety. And that's what I've, I've always liked. I don't want to be flavor bombed and punched in the mouth with a particular thing. I want to feel the whole experience and I want to taste the fermentation process. If it's clean or if it's not, what, what about it do I like or don't like? I want the subtlety so that I can kind of understand it. And you know, perplex me in what yeast you're using or try to guess what temperature you're at. And, you know, I, I don't know. I like to play those cerebral games when I imbibe on anything. And um, I find myself lately doing that. You know, the other, the other night I had one of our beers up at Hobbs and it's been a while since I've done that. And man, it was just so great to, to sip that beer and be like, yeah, all right. I, I get that. I get this note. I find that. And, um, you know, the other day, we not the other day, but early April released a mead that Evan really made. We had, I wanted the three ingredients in it, but I gave him full, full creative um, expanse to design it. And he, it was a rosehip raspberry and uh, hibiscus. And you could go so many directions with that. You, there's a lot going on there besides the color red. And I, I was I, I I've been so impressed with that need coming out. Evan nailed it on the head, nailed it. And um, if anybody has the opportunity to grab that meat, I highly recommend it. It's it's absolutely spectacular and probably What's it called? It, it's experiment uh, experiment number two thousand four. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have a a line of our experimental mead. So like you can see, this is like a a style of an experimental. It's got this medicine apothecary style label on it this is yeah. a boche number three but um it's a, it's it's just an experimental it's an in development if it's in that bottle it's in development and what we do is we watch people drink it we listen to people that that buy it and we try to follow up with them what would you do different what would what did you like about it what didn't you like about it and and then those become those go back into the mix of research and development, and we develop and develop and develop. That mead will become a mainstream mead at some point in time. Hmm. That's Evan great. Nails. You know, you uh, you hit on some points that I think really, it's another reason I really respect what you guys do over there is that, you know, your a lot of your mead really speaks, your, all of your mead in some way or another speaks to a sense of place. It, it's about where the honey comes from. It's about where the mead is made. It's about where the ingredients were harvested or, or grown or, or, uh, or what have you. And, uh, and you guys value that. You value the importance of local. You value the importance of, uh, of having that sense of place. And when you can taste that sense of place in the, in the beverage itself, that makes it something special, more special than just drinking a, a beverage. Um, I always say that, you know, the best wines and beers in the world are those that you can buy within a few miles of where they're crafted because you're going to get the sense of place that you can't get anywhere else you you know from buying a beer that was made or a wine that was made a thousand miles from here and uh, and who knows uh, where it came from so so that's great i appreciate that a lot yeah 
So um, I want to get into uh, I want to get into Hobbs a little bit. Before I do that, though, uh, you guys, I know you're struggling with the same challenges we are as a small business in New Hampshire uh, facing facing this global pandemic that has really you know put a damper on on the world for us. So so just tell our audience and your audience what are some of the things that you're doing and they can do to to continue to appreciate your product and uh, and help you succeed as a business. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so at Sap House Meadery, we're doing, uh, of course, online ordering. So we ship to 43 states. Uh, we, of course, have Club Mead, which you can join, which is four bottles quarterly for $75, uh, and that includes shipping. Uh, that comes with various discounts and promotions. Uh, out of the tasting room, if you're in the area, we're curbside pickup, but we're also a delivery service to four, four towns, Tamworth, Freedom, Effingham, and Ossipee. Uh, and we're doing uh, a menu that you can find online. It is an abbreviated menu, but every week we're always doing something different. One week we did breakfast for dinner. Uh, another week we did Italian. This weekend uh, is Mother's Day, Sunday. Don't forget moms out there. Um, and we're doing a special for that too. And um, of course, we always recommend visiting our retailers. And whether they're doing curbside or delivery or any sort of service, I highly recommend uh, that as well, because you're supporting many people when you buy from retailers. Um, so that's also a plus. We have uh, Dennis, who's our, our sales beast out there, uh, still making it happen. And he's, he's just absolutely uh, killing it uh, out there in the world. So I highly recommend going that route too. But, you know, we have to be creative. We have to get in front of people. And, um, you know, we're trying to pivot. One of the things that we always say at Hobbs is you, ha you have to, uh, stay engaged or be engaged, stay focused and be nimble. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're staying engaged and we're paying attention. And uh, our expectations coming out of this is uh, in, in hopes to change our business model. And we're currently changing our business model. Now the fight is, and we have a letter that's going to uh, all, of, all of the legislators that we can find and, uh, and get it to is, because of the mandates that have occurred, we've been allowed to do certain things we couldn't do pre-COVID. And now we've changed our business model and pivoted. And we hope that once things are lifted, we're allowed to keep our current business model. And I think that's really important uh, for people because there's been investment. I would hate to go back on the employees I'm actually hiring to do a new business model that we really couldn't do in the pre-pandemic stage of, of, of our world. So that's a big push. We're, we're, we wrote a very, very strong letter uh, and we're sending it to everyone we can to make sure that we can continue doing the things we need to uh, because I actually enjoy our new business model. I think if there's a silver lining in things, which I try to always look for as hard as it can be sometimes, uh, this definitely has uh, a silver lining, you know? That's great. That's great. Well, if there's anything that we can do to to help uh, move the ball on some of those issues, let us know because we're we're sure we're sure in support of that that concept. So, yeah. So, sure. so that's great. Uh, so, I I I want to talk a little bit about Hobbs now. You you uh, started your uh, started Sap House Meadery in 2011, and then uh, I don't know was it four or five years ago? Maybe you could tell me. Uh, you partnered with uh, one or, I'm not sure, one or two other people, and you opened up Hobbs Tavern, and uh, really big, big investment, and uh, a big, uh, tall order. It's a, it's a big operation. You're making, you're making a lot of beer, and so, so tell me about that. What, what, what prompted that, and, uh, and how'd, that, how'd that come, be, come to be? So, it's, uh, it's a fun, it's kind of a fun story, actually. Uh, we, as I said earlier, Rob and I were, were, co-workers uh, back at Garwood's um, for several years. We left there. We ended up working at another restaurant together, a place called The Restaurant in Wolfboro um, for a couple of years. And then I left and did Sap House full time. And then in 2013, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, was um, having a, a, a bit of a struggle with the, the Whittier House, which is now Hobbs. It used to be called the Whittier House. And, you know, they were going through a rough patch. And it's such a wonderful landmark. It's always employed a lot of people. It's 
you know, I told the story the other night on Facebook Live that in the 90s, I remember as a kid, my parents taking me there and it was a big deal. Like that was going out to dinner. You were going out to dine. You weren't going out to eat. And, um, you know, the opportunity rose where we, uh, we partnered up. I, I was able to find a financier partner, um, which is something that, you know, people don't quite think of all the time. You know, I, rather than sitting around and going, I wish I had the money to do it. I went out and just found the people with money to do it. And, put the boots on the ground, did the hard work, and we got it going. And that's, we partnered with someone that we had known for a while. Um, and uh, we turned it into what we have today. We opened April 14th, 2014. Uh, it's a 300 seat brew pub and an 1885 Victorian farmhouse. And order, and it was a ton of money. And it was, at times it felt like it was never ending. We remodeled for 14 months and it was, non-stop i mean it, it was it was crazy i i didn't know if i, I was actually convinced it wasn't going to end at some at some point in time um but eventually it did and and we, we we fired away we ended up brewing our first beer uh july of of 2014 and and selling our first beer in august of 14. and um you know the the, the premise behind that still personally is the same as the, as the sap house uh Ossipi is a very big town. It's uh, got three villages. It's got three zip codes, only by post office, but essentially divided by three. And uh, that's a part of town that need, need, needed some love too. And I wanted to bring jobs here. And uh, we employ anywhere from you know 30 to 60 people, depending on the time of the year. Uh, you know, this year will certainly be a, a challenge, but we'll we'll see what we can do in getting everybody back. Uh, to work, but you know, it was really about the revitalization of our of our community and um, and making that happen. And and we're proud to do it. It's during this time in our lives, it's definitely like wow, you know that 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 building and everything in it is like a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. It just doesn't pivot on a dime. You ha you have to make decisions well in advance to be able to make strategy and and execution of those strategies happen. So yeah, it, um, we've been blessed with what we have. We've taken a lot of lickings for, for things, you know, we're constantly evolving and trying and uh, it's a high volume location and, and it's, it's, it's always evolving. And this pandemic that we're in is no different. We're changing our business model there too. You know, it mm -hmm. can't, to go back to what was once comfortable can't be. This gives us the moment to pause, be introspective, be critical about ourselves and management styles and, and business model and make it better. And we have no choice in that. We need to just make it better and always always try to strive for that. That's great, great attitude. What are you doing there to, to uh, make your beer available or I don't know if food's available? What, what What's happening at Hobbs for the, during this pandemic? Yeah, so that was a tough decision. We did take out for the first couple of weeks um, but you know, you, ha as an entrepreneur and a business owner, you have to take stock and inventory of what cash you have, what costs you have, um, reel it in and figure out what your burn rate is to determine how long you can withstand, uh, the break even or the lack thereof. And that's what we did. Um, so we, we did shut it down for a minute just to determine where we were at, take a few days to figure out what we need to do. And currently what we're doing is. Um, we are doing beer curbside, uh, seven, seven days, various hours. You can find those on our Facebook uh, page and our website at hobstavern.com. And we're this, this Sunday, we are going to be launching today, uh, a mother's day special, uh, because we want to take care of those, those wonderful moms out there too. And we're going to put out a wonderful menu. Um, you know, it's going to be short, abbreviated and it'll just be for that one day uh, for, for our fans and guests out there that, that really want some, something special. Um, we are in the process of changing over our system there. So we don't know what it looks like as far as like when dine-in will ever come back. We know that May 18th, it opens up to outdoor seating, but we've decided to take a safety approach uh, before putting any of our staff at risk and any guests at risk uh, we want to take our time. We want to make sure the system is perfect for what we're going for in the new business model. So 
uh, we're not going to jump right in May 18th. We're going to take probably another three or four weeks uh, after that. I would think, you know, I'm not going to be a date certain here. I can't do that. But hopefully mid, mid June, mid to late June, I'd love to be open for the week of the fourth uh, and old home week and all of those. But, you know, I'm not going to do it at the cost of the safety of our staff and, uh, and our guests. I'm just not. It's not worth it. Um, the other thing that I fear as, as a restaurateur and, and business owner is, uh, you know, we, we all, there are startup costs that are associated with firing up again. And what I am afraid of, uh, and I'd rather be cautious than overly optimistic here, is opening up, make, putting major investment in that, get people working, get back to work, only to find out maybe we shouldn't have opened fast, as fast as we did and then be closed again, because that puts us at a, at a severe risk at that point. Um, and it would put anybody at risk uh, and exposure that really I don't think anybody should be um, exposed to. So we're taking a little extra precaution there. Well, I think that's smart. And, and we're in the same boat. Uh, we're feeling the same way. It's probably going to be sometime in the, in the middle of June or late June before Hermit Woods gets open again, for the same reasons. Uh, we want to make sure that we protect our, our team and uh, and of course the the public who who comes in to to uh, experience our experience. So I think it's smart. It's a good way to approach it. So uh, so you're you're also you're also running a business in Belize. <laughs> now tell us about that. How did you you know you you I, I get the story. You you're building the local uh, the local community around Ossipi and and now here you are. Uh, making beer down in Belize. So there's got to be a story there. So what is it? Yeah, so uh, a business partner uh, has uh, always been vacationing there. Um, it's a beautiful spot. It's it's a small country. It's about the size of New Jersey with about 350,000 people in it. Uh, their main drive, their main income and revenue is tourism. You know, there's millions and millions of tourists there. Um, but he, he was down there vacationing and... Um, it's a beer desert. There's no, uh, the place that we're located is a, it's called Placentia. It's a old, old fishing village. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it has one road in, it's a peninsula. So it's one road in. And when he started vacationing, there was a dirt road and it's, it is now paved. I, I know that for, for sure. Um, but we, we saw a great opportunity there because there's only one brewery. Uh, there are a couple more, I think, popping up so it's, it comes with a, a various set of difficulties that we don't have to deal with here, thankfully. Um, but yeah, we, we built that over the last two years, two and a half years. Uh, January of 2018, I was tasked with going there. Uh, we purchased, uh, well, to go there and look at and discuss with a previous brewery owner in San Pedro on Ambergris Key. He had uh, recently gone out of business some things had fallen through and his equipment and license was up for, uh, for sale. And before it hit the market, we had, a, we had knowledge of it and we were able to reach out and um, we set up a time. And I went down in January uh, to go meet with them and look at the equipment. Uh, and then I, I don't know how many times in 2018 I went there. It was probably eight or 10 times. It was every six or eight weeks or so I was down there. And, uh, we had a space, we, we purchased a, an old resort that was once popular through the 80s called Serenity. Um, and we ended up purchasing that, needed massive rehab. I mean, just absolutely massive rehab. But we did it on a timetable that worked for us. We took our time, or still taking our time. It is almost complete. Um, COVID certainly is gonna slow us down, but uh, the resort isn't quite open yet, but we're attached to that resort. We built an extension off of the main main building and that's where we opened and in the june of 2018 i was there was a small bet a small wager put aside that i couldn't build a brewery in a developing country in nine months and uh i partially won i did it in <laughs> in 10. <laughs> and the only reason it was 10 and a month late is is far beyond my control because you have to go through freight forwarders and you're dealing with customs and excise and all of these crazy things. I mean, you just talk about taking things for granted when you're there. Uh, you can't just walk into a hardware store. You can't go to Lowe's and just go grab certain things. They've never, they've never even seen schedule 80 pipe. So like 
you know, I'd go down there and I'd build and build and build and do what I could uh, running glycol lines or plumbing or electrical only to find out I was short X, Y, Z piece or part and I'd have to be back, you know, and I'd video it while I was doing it. I, I am going to at some point post those videos because I'm sitting on a plethora of pretty interesting uh, processes that went, that went on while that was going. I mean, everybody I talked to up here is like, oh, that must be so nice, you know, and it's like, ah, it's like 90 degrees and a wonderful backdrop that tempts you to not work. Uh, but it was worked a hundred percent of the time and it was super hot. And, uh, you know, obviously we're very blessed to be able to have such a, uh, an opportunity, but it is a uh, Hobbs brewing company. Uh, you, we have a, a, we don't have a website yet for it. Uh, we're going through a new rebrand right now that will launch and it'll tell us better. Uh, we do have a Facebook page for Hobbs Belize where you can see, uh, where we were, where we've, where we've been and where we're going. Um, our brewer down there is a Belizean. Uh, we have Roland and Garrick, and they're both just absolutely awesome. Um, our brewer up here, our two, we had two brewers up here that went down and spent time there, uh, several, several months there uh, to train up and, and to brew to spec what we were looking for. And down there, we operate a seven barrel brew house. Um, we have a Twin Monkeys uh, Gun Gunnison canning line. That's excellent. I can't wait to get down there and, and visit myself once this uh, this COVID thing yeah. is over. Love so that. January, <laughs> January sounds thought, like the right month. Yeah, well, out of all the times I've been down there, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to get home. You know, at this point in time, I'm like, I can't wait to get back there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's no doubt you're a busy man. You always have been. You 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 got your hands in the, in the Sap House Meadery. You're running the Hobbs tavern and i know hobbs has got some expansion things going on right here in town i don't know if you want to talk about that you got belize going on how do you find the time to take care of you and and i know you also have a, a young family you uh you, you recently had a child so you've got a lot going on how do you find time to to uh to be with your family with all it's, of that it's difficult yeah I, I would be lying if i said it, it wasn't um every day i wake up to my reasons of why I work so hard. Um, you know, even when I was young, 18, 19, 20, I knew I would be an entrepreneur, uh, probably even earlier than that. When I sold used golf balls back to the clubhouse here locally in Ossipee and called them experienced <laughs> golf balls, <which laughs> when I was 12 was probably the moment. Um, but, you know, I wake up every day reminded by, you know, reminded with the reason why I do what I do. And uh, while I think, um, you know, my family is wildly supportive of what I do, I think more than supportive, they're extremely tolerant of me. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I know I'm not easy. I'm high energy. I, I you know, I, I, I work late. I work a lot. My head isn't uh, always focused. But, you know, again, that, that, that silver lining in the touch of gray right now is that we, this, this whole period in the pandemic has been a, a reminder of mindfulness and it's forced me to slow down. Um, you'd think an illness 18, you know, 20 months ago would have done that. And it did. Uh, but this has really allowed me to be home, uh, work from home a little bit more. Um, and spend the time with my family and, and it's been awesome. You know, I, it's been great. Today is actually uh, my wife's birthday. Um, so oh, cool. af after this, it's, it's celebration time. Um, but yeah, Ethan is three. He is uh, a tough negotiator. He is a wildly creative mind and uh, a kindred spirit for sure. And uh absolutely love everything about him he's got the best of both shana and myself that's for sure so you know the you, i i think i think to do this to be an entrepreneur um you know you, you have to at some point take a breath uh but it's hard to do i i have a really hard time slowing down i have an extremely hard time and when i find times of lack of stress i feel uncomfortable there are times that you know to speak candidly to Facebook Live right now, that would be that would be something that comes with it for me personally. 
Um, and I think that happens early on with working in restaurants and kitchens. You know, uh, I, I remember dreaming of ticket machines nonstop. And I remember volume seasons at, on the lake in Wolfboro working crazy hours. And, you know, re the Anthony Bourdain lifestyle isn't a joke. Like there's a lot of reality in a lot of his stories. And uh, I think that when things are over, overly calm, I think comes a sense of, you know, an oh shit moment. And like, hmm. there's, there's comfort and stress. And, and that, I can only speak for myself in that, of course. But, uh, but I, I think that I find comfort in that. And, and when I have to have a date certain and a, and a time period to get things done and there's pressure, I, I operate at my highest efficiency and, and creative skill. I, I actually can relate to that. I mean, I think probably a lot of entrepreneurs can. Uh, I feel the same way. If if, uh, if I'm under pressure, I'm going to be much more efficient and uh, and more effective and more creative. So uh, it's a double-edged sword sometimes because uh, I, I get under pressure. And that's when also when you make mistakes and you do things maybe you shouldn't do. But but uh, I think at the end of the day, that's where I perform the best. So I, I totally sympathize. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it just what um when you are you know when you do get away from the business and uh either with the family or without is there something about you that that we don't know that uh some particular pastime that you really uh want to share that you really get into i know you're a musician i don't know if that would be it but. yeah yeah i mean so uh yeah i used to i used to be a, a bit of a little touring musician i've played with some amazing bands and if you dig deep enough in google you'll you'll drum up some uh some some things but uh you know lately it's been working around the house like it, if i need to work on me it's about working around my house i still have to remain focused and then be task and job oriented um mm. but i find such a wonderful passion and, and comfort when the job is done for the day and i you know i think all guys do this i'm sure women do it too but like when you finish a job like i just painted like my new railings at my house and new installed new balusters myself like 10 11 o'clock at night i went in the middle of the road and like stared at it you know like and that's you know i was like wow job well done got it done awesome you know and i i think that that little bit of gratification goes a long way and and knowing that you can complete a task you have to complete some tasks small tasks along the way to complete the big tasks otherwise you're going to feel like it's this hamster wheel um, when it comes to like really like stepping aside, the, a cool thing has happened over the last like two or three weeks since my son turned three, and that is his appreciation for music and fishing. <laughs> so my uh, my dad bought him a fishing rod, and so uh, whipping that like fake fish that's a little weight around our yard and out in the pond behind the house has been absolutely hilarious to watch. Uh, that's and uh, I think I think that's a really great way to get away. And um, you know, with Shana and I, uh, it's really just I can look across the table at her and just get a sense of comfort. You know, I, she's we're all in a sense of stress right now. You know, we all have that, and it's hard to hide that. We're all in this like crazy, unprecedented time of uncertainty. And but there are these little glimmers. I can look at her, and I know she doesn't know I'm looking, and I can see peace. And every once in a while, and it's just. I find a lot of, of comfort in that and it recharges my batteries even even in those glimmers, you know, those flashes in the pan. So but you know, I uh I enjoy playing music myself. I've actually taken the time to get back into it and I'm trying to reinvent that as well. I I I started a Facebook live channel to tell the story of Sap House, to tell the story of Hobbs, and I'm gonna get into some stories of Ossipy, but I also wanna get on there and play some music because I don't think the people I was friends with in 2007, I've gained so many over the last decade that a lot of those people don't know I even do that. And uh, I'm certainly rusty, but you know, if there's something I could share with people and, and they go, wow, you know, that's really cool. Or, oh, that song is really nice. I enjoy it. And give them a sense of forgetting the world around them. That's, that's huge. You know, I've always said as a, as a musician that music is the sound of feelings. And, and I, I can dig pretty deep into those feelings when I when I get into it. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to be throwing out some some music on Facebook and and sharing that side of my life. And you know, I am also writing a book. 
That's hard. Awesome. Oh That's yeah. That's painful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward yeah. to seeing the outcomes of both the, the short run, the music scene that you're going to get into in the next <laughs> few weeks. And, uh, and I'll look forward to reading that book someday. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm patient. <laughs> um, so a uh, couple more things. Uh, yeah. Question I like to ask everybody. Have you, uh, have you figured out what you want to be when you grow up? A kid at heart. So you don't <laughs> want to grow up? No, I mean, I, I think I've taken life very, very seriously already. You know, I've always been an extremely serious person. Yes, I can be funny. Yes, you can get me going. And, uh, and I'm, I'm extremely extroverted and social. Um, but I, take things very, very seriously. And the biking thing in my world is loosen up a little bit and not be so serious. Um, I mean, in all honesty, I just want to leave this world better than I found it. And if, if that it means, you know, none of this works out and I go back to working in a kitchen and, and flipping burgers or I find another job or whatever, uh, you know, I'll bounce back and do it all again. Um, I still will always have that positive impact that I want to leave on the world. I mean, you know, as, as, you know, nostalgic and romantic as that sounds, um, you know, it's deep rooted in me, you know, uh, Great. at times we think time is short and at times time is all we have. So mm. I like to make the best of it, I guess. Awesome. That's a great answer. So, um, so I know you've done some traveling. Have you, uh, is there a special winery brewery or or place that you visited that that comes with a, a, a brief story that uh that you want to share in you know your travels of visiting other places around the new england or around the world you know um nothing quickly comes to mind because i take so much i take little things from every place I've been to um mm. you know uh, that's a real that's the hardest question I think I've ever I've been asked Bob that, and I get in I get interviewed quite a bit and I think that's a really awesome question um I I think one thing that I have found and it's not it's not a place specific but it's a state of mind that I have found across the places I've traveled is that we all talk that we're all in this together. We all say, oh, in the brewing world, everybody looks out for each other. Breweries help breweries. And I feel the same way with meteries. I mean, I, I, I used to at one time be able to list off every metery. Now I, I can't, they're just popping <laughs> up so fast. But the one, the one thing that is true that I can honestly say is that that is not just a saying. That is not just cheap words. It's there is so much weight behind it. I have I have been I have seen the back rooms, the back inner workings of some of the coolest and craziest breweries and wineries. I've I've met some of the most fascinating and interesting people in this industry. And you know, in my Rolodex, I could call some of the coolest, uh, well-known people in this industry. And they would quickly be like, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And it, it happens all the time. It happened last, last week, you know, uh, Steve Johnson up at Moat. Um, I needed something. I gave him a call. And, you know, even in the mix of all of what's going on, he was quick to help. Uh, Kirsten, uh, Kristen at, at Tuckerman, same way. Like, the response is there. And I know that's geographical. But I know that if I went anywhere and was like, hey, I need, I need help. I need this. I need that that would happen and that would occur. And I, I know this really isn't answering the question that you asked and I, and I get that, but I, if I could bring a sense of comfort to the people that are in this industry and that are doing it, from an entrepreneur standpoint, all you have to do is ask for help. That's the hardest part of it all. I think after that, most people will jump at the opportunity to do such a thing. Um, and I think that that, is a state of mind that I've noticed amongst 
uh, all of the great places I've, I've visited. That's great. That's a great answer to that question, actually. And, uh, and it's one of the things that I've always respected about you and, and Matt at, at, uh, at Sap House. As we said, we started around the same time as you, and I can't count the number of times that, that, uh, that you and I and, and Matt and Ken have, have come to each other's aids when, you know, we need to short up on bottles or, or how do you solve this problem or that problem? And, uh, and you guys yeah. have been, been there for us many times uh, during that time. So it's, it's a great sensibility and, and not all businesses get that. Uh, a lot, you know, there, there's, a, there's a Yankee sort of go at your own uh, kind of attitude that some people tend to have and kind of covet their, their, their secrets, if you will. But, but we've always felt the opposite of that. And I think you guys have too, that, that uh, we can't go this alone. We got to go it together. And if we go it together, we're both going to benefit from it. We're both going to, uh, our businesses are going to grow from it. So uh, that's a great answer. So no, thank you. I've never, I've never once in, in the 10, 11 years through the entire process of this, never ever once thought of Hermit Woods, Moonlight Meadery, uh, Apollo, anyone around us. I've never ever thought of competition. People come in and be like, oh, I've visited your competition. And I, I get what you're trying to do there. But I've quick, I am very quick to shut that down and be like, oh, our friends over there. You know, if you had gone through the tour, we would have sent you there. You know, and that we, we pride ourselves on that. We have a whole rack over there, uh, right here in the meadery that has everybody's name on it. You know, we, we really are uh, trying to help everyone. You know, geographically, you guys help us maybe more than others, and we help maybe help you more than others, but it's, it's mere geography. It's not a, uh, a niche thing or a clicky thing. It's, it's easy, it's, it's, it's convenient, and, and it's helpful. Um, and there's comfort in that. You know, we, Ken is, Ken is always, you know, he, he uh, <laughs> I, I, the first time I ever met Ken, he blew my mind. Like, I thought I was a geek, and this is before Matt and I had <laughs> employees. So it was like, you know, just hands in it, going deep. Like, uh, Ken and I one night was, I, I forget where we were. It was, it was an event. Uh, it might have even been an annual meeting for the New Hampshire Winery Association. I can't remember. But Ken geeked out so hard that it was like, it left an impact on me. And I was like, yep, I, I like that guy. That guy, he, wow. Like, if I could ever step away from this and you guys could step away and take a minute and get us back in a room together and a few, few drinks in us, oh my gosh. Like, that's worth a Zoom meeting. That's worth a, a fireside chat, maybe. Not a Zoom meeting, a fireside chat. And, um, but, you know, I, I think the birds of a feather kind of flock together. And, and I, I think it's always a, it's a, it's a great relationship. And, and I, I'm glad to be a part of it. And, you know, what you're doing here, Bob, you know, you talk about, you've always been a marketing guy. You know, you, you're very good at that. You, we've, we've always kind of followed along in that. And you have your knowledge there. And what you're doing right now with this uh, live, uh, Facebook Live and, and Zoom here is exactly what is needed. You know, I always believe everyone has a message for you. It's for, up to you to discern what that is. And I think by doing this, while they call it social distancing, we haven't wanted to socialize more. It's physical distancing, really. Um, what you're doing is a positive impact, and it's, it's huge. You, don't, you aren't even seeing yet the rewards or benefits uh, to what this is. And to the people that are watching, they may not even recognize the rewards and the benefits of what you're trying to do. And it's not about Hermit Woods. You know, that may be a benefit, a byproduct, um, but it's not about that. And I think that right there is a perfect example of why I feel like Sap House gets along so well with Hermit Woods. So thank you for doing what you're doing and bringing this to the people that are watching. Well, awesome. you're welcome. That's great. No, that's great. Thank you for that. And, uh, and I look forward to, to many more years of it into the future. It also reminds me, we're, um, we had a great conversation with a winemaker from South Africa last Saturday, and uh, Craig and Ken started to, to geek out a little bit toward the end of the conversation and get into some of the nitty gritty of the, of the production of their wines. And I, it was toward the end of our hour long presentation, so I, I put them on hold and I said, wait guys, wait, wait, this is another conversation. 
And not only is it another conversation, we have to get somebody else in on this conversation who's going to appreciate it. So I would like to right here and now uh, invite you to join Ken and I and Craig and possibly one or two other people on another Zoom conference to dig hard on some real technical, uh, you know, the nitty gritty of what it is you do and why you do it. Um, I think you'll, you'll love Craig. He's, uh, he's, he's in it for the same reasons that we are. He's, he's, a, he's a, a kindred spirit in that way. And, and so if you'd like to join us, we'd, we'd, I'd like to invite you to, to be part of that conversation. A absolutely. Invitation accepted. And I, I look forward to the education. Awesome. We'll, uh, we'll set that up in the next week or two. So we'll, you'll be hearing yeah. from me. Um, we're running out of time, so a couple things I want to leave off with. First of all, is there any big news that you are either can or you won't share, but want to, want to kind of give us a tip about happening at Sap House or Hobbs or Belize, or is there anything big coming up that we don't know about that you can share, or you just want to say, yeah, something big is coming up? Uh, well, we do. We have a couple big things. I mean, some may or may not know, but we have a production brewery firing up uh, here in Ossipee. Uh, which once opened, will actually have uh, a business in all three zip codes of Ossipi, which is amazing. It makes <laughs> mail very, very confusing. Um, but uh, we, uh, we do have a lot coming out. Uh, I think that with Hobbs, I think, I hope people will uh, follow us on Facebook and watch what's about to take place. But, you know, with the COVID thing, uh, it's, it's time to dig deep and change our our, our model and, and be creative. And I think uh, me and the team have worked really hard in drawing that picture. So we do have that coming. Uh, the new production site will be coming. It's gonna be coming online uh, hopefully in the next month or so, we'll see. I mean, we have a few things, some hoops to go through and, and, and stuff, but uh, we'll have the tasting room firing off down there and, and uh, in, in due time and, and stuff like that with Sap House. Uh, man, there's just so much going on. I mean, we're building a business inside of a business with our new delivery model and de delivery system. Um, I will say uh, the next club release that's coming out is a monster. And I, I hate to, to give it such emphasis because I feel like every quarter we release it, it's like, I say that, like, oh, it's the biggest one, it's the best one. Like the next one coming up is, super impressive and uh, because of the Facebook live things that I've been doing I'm going to start doing an unboxing and I'm going to start talking more uh, about what we do I, I broke out of my shell uh, and I, I, I've never really done the Facebook live thing I've talked to audiences before but it's very different when you're talking into a screen and no one really live to answer you unlike today and uh, look for that like i feel like that is going to be really fun and really different and and i hope people will join us through that journey great some exciting stuff all right well let's um uh let's wrap this up just uh, anything that anything else any anything we missed that you want to share with everybody before we say goodbye about about you or about your business about anything final words parting words Part, parting words uh man what a crazy time we're in um <laughs> you know I, I i think i think everyone needs to know it's all okay to be a little loopy at times and not have it not always have it together you know i feel like through the process of this quarantine and all that you know i've cycled through that cycle of grief whether it be denial and confusion madness and anger and whatever um you know, but I think everybody does need to give themselves a little bit of time to, to breathe. Um, what I would ask is uh, check out my Facebook page, which is my name personally. It's Ash Fishbine. And uh, follow me on there because I'm going to start getting into some really cool stories. Uh, I'm going to start talking about the entrepreneurial journey that I've been on uh, and some of the hard decisions I've had to make along the way. Also some highlights to some of the things we don't get to talk about um, as we make uh, certain milestones in our, in our business lives that, that uh, we intend to share but sometimes get forgotten. And I've dug deep into some of the past uh, stories that I've wanted to do with Sap House and Hobbs and I want to share that. I want to be a sounding board for uh, entrepreneurs that, that may um, 
have some questions in just general, but also through some of the trying times because uh, together is the only way we're going to get through it. So that would be my parting words. Be, be good to one another. Be kind. Be patient. Have a Thank meeting. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm going to Thank just say you, a few Mom. words before we uh, before we go. And and I want to start with. Uh, uh, it may not be possible to visit right now, but but uh, if you haven't had a chance to try Sap House Mead or Hobbs Beer, uh, put it on your list. Uh, I I highly recommend both. They're uh, they're doing some fun and creative things up there, as you've just learned from listening to uh, to to us chat. So yeah, put it on your list. And uh, and if you uh, if you if you didn't know. We're going to be doing these conversations with people into the future. You just heard us talk about an upcoming one that I'm really excited about now with a, with a few uh, geeky winemakers talking about their, their thing. So, uh, so stay tuned on our Facebook page for, I mean, on our website for upcoming events that are being scheduled as we speak. And, uh, and be well, stay healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you out there in the world someday. And uh, thank you again, Ash. We'll, uh, we'll be thank in you, touch Bob. soon. All thank right. you. Take care. Take care. Thank you for watching our video today. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. If you would like to see more videos like this, click the subscribe button or visit our webpage to see a list of all upcoming events and watch previously recorded interviews and presentations. From all of us here at Hermit Woods, thank you for watching. Be well and stay safe.